Thank you so much. Um, energy really goes to the heart of how we live, where we live, and it also goes very much to the heart of uh, what we eat, where we produce <coughs> food, what we consume in general. And so this really brings us to another dimension of the climate change challenges and solutions aspect uh, that we wanted to cover this semester, and uh, very specifically want to talk about agriculture from two different perspectives. One much more at the global, from the global to the local, and one from the local to the global, if I may say it that way. Uh, with two speakers uh, who are here uh, in the reverse order in which they are shown, uh, John Riley will uh, speak first. He's a co-director of the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change and an energy environmental and agricultural economist. Uh, much of his work uh, concentrates on the impacts that human activities have on the climate and vice versa how these climate change effects then reverberate and feedback to affect human action uh, in the context of uh, energy production and food production. And obviously the two of those are closely related with each other given the fact that we use a lot of energy to produce food and we now increasingly uh, plan to divert biomass to produce energy. So there are lots of interesting uh, land use and other conflicts in the making as well. Uh, Molly Anderson holds uh, the Partridge Chair in Food and Sustainable Agriculture Systems at the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, where she teaches on hunger and food security, fixing food systems, sustainability, and systems dynamics. Uh, the letter that closely links up uh, to uh, some of the games that we have played last week, if you have been here. Uh, the way of thinking about uh, unintended consequences and uh, how to control them in a systems perspective. Uh, she has worked as a private consultant uh, for domestic and international organizations with Office of America and uh, was for many years at Tufts University where she founded uh, the Agriculture, Food and Environmental Graduate Program and also for two years was the director of the Tufts Institute of the Environment. I want to welcome you both and I um, want to start with uh, John. Oh, and, yes, please. And while, while he's coming up, I also wanted to remind you or want to introduce to you two questions that I want you to think about um, as we uh, progress through this evening. Uh, and uh, after the two speakers are done, we'll come back to this question. So uh, have a quick look at those, uh, think about them as we go along, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks. So thank you for the introduction. Pleased to be here. We have some fun ways to hope that you hope interact by giving some answers to these questions at the end, so give some thought. Um, agriculture changing climate and sustainable food production. There's a lot of pretty pictures on this slide, but they're meant to illustrate kind of some of the many different dimensions of agriculture and many different ways we look at agriculture from a beautiful wheat field to a rice paddy to the table prepared with food to the industrial side of food, large grain elevators or the uh, uh, genetic engineering and biotechnology, uh, machinery, uh, fresh food, and, this, and of course the soil, which is critical, and as well the nutrition. So food it, uh, intersects and has a lot of complexity with, with our life. Uh, there are numerous forces affecting agriculture. One, of course, uh, uh, it's meeting the world's growing and changing demand for food and population income in, and income increase. So we'll probably approach a population of 10 billion or so by somewhat after 2050. Uh, and as incomes increase around the world, um, uh, more uh, or poorer countries are adapting, adopting diets more like ours, which involve a lot of meat and then are much more resource intensive uh, than grains. Uh, agriculture uh, is being affected by a variety of environmental changes, climate change, tropospheric ozone, aerosol haze, soil degradation, all a current challenge for maintaining uh, yields. Uh, and then we have, as mentioned earlier, other competition for land and water to meet energy, recreation, and urbanization needs. Uh, uh, and, and the biomass story is, is an important one of that, if that should be a big part of our, our energy solution. Uh, there's also, agriculture is a contributor to environmental problems. Uh, it's a contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, it's a significant contributor there through nit nitrogen fertilizer use, nitrous oxide emissions, methane from uh, rice paddies, uh, CO2 from the energy use involved or from uh, converting forest to, to uh, cropland, uh, but then soil erosion, nutrients in streams, lakes, and coastal areas. Uh, 
And then I think local agriculture will face continued competitive pressure from increasingly globalized agricultural markets. A good thing maybe is change in technology. The one way we've kept up with uh, growing populations over the, over the years has been ever improving uh, yields of crops. Uh, and then there is this process that people talk about the industrialization of agriculture, which is a very broad term, and it's a little bit hard to nail down, but it really is, uh, has been moving agriculture uh, really into the industrial structure of the economy with lots of trade across the world, uh, uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, vertically integrated production with firms in one way or another, uh, risk pooling, risk sharing, Again, I, we can kind of ask, will these increase agricultural sustainability or make it more difficult to achieve? So that's kind of the, uh, the uh, some of the story. Then the climate issue. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the climate sort of story, but this is just a history of, of a recent history of warming. Uh, the one map from 1880 to, to about 2010, and the other one focuses just on the last uh, two decades. Uh, we've heard a lot of the news recently about fact that if you go back to 1998 or so, there has been no warming trend in the last decade. But uh, you know, if you look at this longer pattern of change, you see that, in fact, even with no change in the recent decade, uh, we're much warmer than we were uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And the overall trend uh, is upward. We know there are lots of natural variability aspects of the climate. And so the recent kind of somewhat slow uh, not a big increase in warming uh, is not really unexpected as you look at this past because of the of, of forces of natural variability. The spike in 1998 was an ENSO year, and so that was, a, and ENSO brings a lot of warm water to the Pacific Ocean, and so that is a, a normal variation. It uh, uh, tends to create a much warmer te temperature, and so that was a much, a very high ENSO. We've actually not had big ENSOs in recent years, so that variation has, has contributed to uh, you know, not so much warming in recent years as one example. But there's still a debate about what this means in the literature. Uh, I mean, I think most of us think that, you know, while we've gotten lucky over the past decade, follow on on this, maybe even more warming than we thought. So rather than take comfort in this, we ought to uh, probably be concerned. And then the, uh, the bottom picture just shows this uh, a, a kind of clear evidence of warming with a, a large change in sea ice. Uh, that really has surprised uh, scientists that, that it has gone away that fast, looking at in the middle, I think, uh, well, kind of the disappearance in September 2007, which is the largest, and the red to the line showing the normal extent of that uh, average over the past few decades of what that would have been. So about half of the ice uh, lost. What are some of the, uh, so if, if some of the ways that climate affects um, agriculture and food, I say here it's hard to imagine the observed changes in climate have not affected agriculture in some way, but the effects are mixed, are likely mixed, benefiting crops in some areas and harming crops in other areas. Uh, you know, we've had this record drought the last year in the United States. How much of that was really a climate signal is, is hard to say. Uh, on the bottom left, we see this uh, picture of uh, this uh, figure with a probability density function of temperatures in Europe and, and, and all the warmest temperatures way out in the far right tail, uh, several of those have been uh, in the last uh, decade. So, so when we move out, we know that there's normal variation in the climate, but when we see repeated, uh, uh, repeated things way out on the high end, uh, it's pretty clear that, 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 that something about this is not normal and that the climate signal is evidence. On the top left, we see one of the possible positive effects of, of CO2 on plant growth. Uh, uh, you know, evidence suggests that doubling CO2 will increase plant uh, growth by 20 to 30% for or crop yields for 20 to 30%. Um, uh, that's from a lot of different lines of evidence. So that is a kind of a positive side. CO2 is a fertilizer in plants. But then right below that, uh, one of the things scientists observe that it, it seems to really uh, improve uh, the uh, uh, growth of weeds. Uh, so, so you have, on the one hand, higher yields, but then weeds that are uh, on this bottom part 
380, possibly related to 680, and it also means that then are much more resistant to pesticides. So that could mean even more pesticide use in order to kind of control ever more uh, 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 weeds. So, um, you know, there, there are some benefits. We may see longer growing season than cold, uh, limited areas, uh, limited yields where he exceeds critical thresholds, uh, damage from climate extremes. One of the biggest problems we have in assessing this is just we don't have good predictions of how climate extremes will really change. You know, the droughts and other sorts of things just aren't well predicted by the climate models. So that's an ongoing area of work. And then subtle effects on past CO2 fertilization, crop quality, and then precipitation is really important. But that's one of the poorest predicted uh, elements of the climate system. So this is some work from uh, Lobel et al. Uh, just showing what's happened uh, to the temperature and precipitation in some of the main growing reasons uh, over the past uh, few decades. And it shows a clear warming signal in much of Europe and, uh, and, and, and China, for example, and, and less so in other parts of the world, some in Africa, some in South America. Interestingly, you know, somewhat cooling actually in, in, in the US. So the US has kind of been an outlier on this for a time. Uh, there's some debate about why the temperatures in the US have not warmed up as much. But I think the past few years, with this drought and heat last year, all of a sudden, whatever that cooling effect in the United States seems to have uh, uh, been turned away. So maybe not surprising that the US has been uh, less aggressive and concerned about climate change in some other places, because we just haven't observed as much here as many other parts of the world. Um, and then the precipitation trends are just not as strong. And I'd say the precipitation is very complex because uh, it's not over the, only the long-lived greenhouse gases, but aerosols uh, strongly affect precipitation. Uh, you know, I talk, we talk about technology, uh, you know, one of the way, things that have saved us uh, in the past, you know, half century or more has been growth in crop yields. And this is the evidence from the U.S. on yield growth. We kind of take a look at this. You see that on the one hand, we've had this very strong yield growth in many crops over the past uh, 60 or 70 years, but before that we really had none. So we, we've been living on the, on, on the last 60 years, you know, trusting that crop yield growth will continue forever. It's been a relatively modern phenomenon for a long history. And so there are a lot of questions of, of can it continue. Um, one of the challenges here as you try to project yield growth is, uh, this is I think from uh, data for China. If you look, if you, if, you were, if you were in 1975 and you took China's yield growth uh, and you projected it out at the same rate, what you get is that blue uh, line on the bottom, and you project it with a lot of uncertainty given that rate sort of thing. So you would have, uh, and then we have the black line as the actual yields, you would have greatly underpredicted uh, under predicted yields. But if you go just another uh, 15 years in a row and take the time trend, then you get the red line, and then we usually overpredict it. So, uh, and then more recently from the 1990s, you'd be closer, but you'd be somewhere in the middle. So one of the problems is uh, we're really uncertain about why, how yields, how fast yields can grow and what they, and what they really do. So, you have to, so that's a huge uncertainty in just what's happened. Obviously, some of it kind of feeds back. If, we're, if we have low agricultural prices and surpluses, there's not a lot of incentive to increase yields. So there's an economic component of it. But it's very hard to kind of separate those and understand what's going on. Uh, this is some work uh, we did actually now several years ago uh, where we're kind of having a high pollution case where climate change, uh, uh, CO2 concentrations are reaching seven or 800 parts per million. Um, uh, there's large ozone damage as well because of the, another effect of using fossil fuels. And you see the, the reds are very negative uh, effects on crops. Uh, we have crop yields falling by as much as like 43% in the United States, 80% uh, in, in, uh, in China or Japan, I believe, and 64% uh, in China. So large uh, drops in yields in major growing areas. Uh, if we take a policy that controls greenhouse gases and ozone precursors, many of these losses disappear. So that's the bottom, uh, bottom, uh, bottom uh, line there. You do see some of these high productivity regions in the top graph, and that's areas that aren't directly affected by the ozone damage, but are forests and other areas that are benefiting significantly from the CO2. And in some cases, northern areas like uh, Canada, Russia, with the warming is actually benefiting plant growth, so you're getting more uh, carbon storage uh, 
on uh, enforced and more net primary productivity. So it is a mixed picture, um, uh, you know, very spatially diverse in terms of, of what's happening. But the major crop growth reasons, crops are particularly sensitive to ozone, so they are suffering there. And then this is some new work. Um, we're trying to focus in on just what might happen in the breadbasket uh, crop yield. So we focused on the, the corn belt in the United States, the wheat areas, growing regions in China and uh, Asia, corn also in uh, maize in Africa, and then soybean in South America. And uh, we have, there's four cases here, uh, high climate sensitivity, we're uncertain about climate sensitivity. So here temperatures are reaching as much as uh, seven degrees C above present. Uh, and then a, 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 a low climate sensitivity where we have the same amount of CO2, but the climate is just less responsive, so a little bit less warming. Um, and, then, uh, and then a policy case, which is trying to kind of keep uh, CO2 concentrations around 550 parts per million. So that's on the bottom. Interesting, when you look at the global averages on the figures on the bottom, you're seeing that the yields on average are not falling or changing that much, and there's increases somewhere and decreases uh, other, where, other places. Uh, even in this business as usual case, the high and low are the high and low climate sensitivity, or the ranges from the two climate sensitivities. So there is this kind of pattern of, of agriculture where losses somewhere, but gains other places, kind of making up for each other. I wanted to go in on that a little bit deeper and show just patterns uh, expanded for these grain belts. And here you see a pattern we, we often see, and that is that the, the areas towards the equator, you know, there the blue is huge losses, as much as 50% loss in yields in the southern parts of the corn belt area, but then gains in, in northern areas. So that's a pattern we see, you know, very regularly. And so they kind of balance out at some level but you can imagine that this kind of transition is going to cause a lot of adjustment. So how farmers would adjust and move to that uh, uh, would, would cause a lot of dislocation. So we need to kind of think about how that uh, is, is taken in, into account. And this is just one, again, this is just one climate model simulation with multiple climate sensitivities. And so it doesn't really represent the uncertainty that we really see when we look at climate sensitivity. So that's the big signal here, we kind of try to make some estimates. How good we are at doing them uh, is unclear. We try to kind of understand uh, what, what may be at risk and how it might change. So these are preliminary results. We're still working on this. But this is one of the highest resolution efforts to kind of really simulate crop yields, you know, really spatially extend so we can see this kind of, you know, pattern that you see rather than just do a few uh, spots in a few different places. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about some of this complex interaction. We talked earlier really about all these forces um, affecting, uh, affecting agriculture. So one of the possible, well, a couple of the possible solutions to the climate change issue do focus on land use. So one is to, um, uh, is to provide carbon, if you want to price carbon to, on CO2 emissions for fossil energy, you might also like to create incentives for landholders to reforest their land, because when you grow a forest, uh, you take up carbon. So we, we wanted to look at some policies where we extended uh, the carbon pricing uh, that was trying to achieve 550 parts per million uh, from avoided CO2 emissions to also take up, uh, use the forest to take up carbon and see how much more we could get out of that. The, the, the top bullet there is what we got, we got another we avoided another half degree of warming. And so you see in the, in the base case, uh, first panel, uh, without any policy, we're getting up to six degrees C of warming above, uh, above pre-industrial. So that's this massive amount of warming. Uh, you know, we talked about two or three degrees as being a dangerous level. This is three to two or three times more than that. And really at that level, I don't think anyone questions that the Greenland ice sheet and West Antarctic ice sheet would be you know, rapidly becoming history, right? So the 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 550, uh, the, the kind of the carbon price we have uh, starts at I think $25 a ton and gets to about $750 a ton by the end of the century. Um, avoiding fossil fuel emissions take a big chunk out of that. It's getting down to about 2.8 degrees warming above pre-industrial, which is a lot better than six. 
but still uh, somewhat above that, uh, uh, the kind of two degree target. So when we add in the land scenario, then we're getting within, um, within striking distance of this two degree target, uh, you know, 2.2 or 2.3. Um, the concentrations of CO2 uh, are in the middle, uh, showing what's happening there. And then the last one is what's really happening to carbon uh, on, in, in land. So the bottom one there is if we don't, if we let the, let the climate go, what happens is we need more cropland for, we're getting a lot of damage from ozone of crops uh, and a lot of damage from climate change. So we have to expand the amount of land planted to crops. So we actually worsen the situation even further by causing deforestation and, and, and soil and loss of, of, of terrestrial carbon. Um, uh, the middle case is when we just have a, a carbon policy uh, that is only a, using fossil fuels. So that essentially keeps us in about balance with the land carbon. And then if we actually create this uh, incentives for reforestation, you see we get a huge amount of carbon storage uh, in, the, in, in, in lands as we uh, grow forest. But you can imagine that um, that is going to uh, take land out of agriculture and will have some impact on, on, on food. So this is just showing the regional patterns of change in land carbon as a result of those. Uh, the no policy case uh, is that unrestricted uh, emissions. And you see there, uh, we have a, end up seeing a lot of land use change in Africa in particular, uh, but also uh, even carbon loss into North America and Europe and, and, and Asia and somewhat in um, South America. The energy only policy uh, avoids some of that because then less of this northern area land is being turned into cropland. And so we uh, 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 avoid some of that loss. And then the energy plus land there, we're mostly having carbon storage. And we added no biofuel story in there. Biofuels are part of this mix as well. Uh, in the energy only one, uh, interestingly, while it was kind of surprising to us, um, while we were, uh, uh, because of the avoided damage to crops, we actually had more ability to produce biofuels than we might have, because we were actually saving some of the crop land compared to the uh, no policy case. And, but this is the kind of the story on food prices uh, that we're seeing. And this again was kind of a surprise. The, uh, the solid line, which is the less, least increase in food prices is a no policy case. <laughs> uh, the short dash is the energy only uh, uh, case. Uh, the, uh, and then the long dash is the energy plus land. So interestingly, at least in this, these results, the, the, the case that gets the least climate change has the biggest increase in prices. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the no policy case, we're getting environmental damage to crops. Um, that we take a lot of that away when we deal with the energy only. Remember the climate scenario was much lower. But energy is important input into agriculture. So the costs of agriculture go up even as the damage is avoided. So it's kind of a mixed, uh, uh, nearly offsetting, uh, offsetting uh, case. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we do all, when we try to do the land policy, just an awful lot of land goes into reforestation at the, at the expense of food. So we're getting food price increases of 80% you know, in that case. Uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent uh, in the other cases. The dotted line is when there's no biofuels. If we take biofuels out of the picture, then we can get that land carbon storage with, um, you know, with some less in increase in, in prices. But the land carbon storage, the reforestation, is really the is really the big is, is, is a strong driver in, in this in this. Group. So, you know, returning to uh, returning to the. Uh, you know, kind of the opening slide, just reminding ourselves um, of some of the forces affecting agriculture. Instead, I think turning these into questions. Uh, how to supply 10 billion people, many with greater meat and diets? Uh, can we limit environmental changes? And how to adapt to unavoidable change? I don't think any, you know, we know that the climate is going to continue to change somewhat, even if we do our best to kind of try and reduce 
emissions, it's kind of hard to go backwards. Uh, how to meet competing demands uh, for natural resources. How do we want to use our land? Uh, will we use it to store carbon? Use it to preserve uh, biodiversity? Will we use it to produce food? Uh, can we do, will we use it for, for, for bioenergy as a replacement for fossil fuels? Uh, you know, there's, it's a, it's a, some have called it the trilemma of, uh, of what to do with land and how to kind of solve, uh, you know, several pressing uh, needs. And then how to farm with less impact on the environment, uh, how to maintain diversity, support local agriculture, remain resilient in the face of our environmental change, uh, and how to control technology toward positive end, ends, what trade-offs uh, might we accept. And then I guess what is the role of industrial agriculture uh, our small community-based farms, an important cultural thing, but maybe on the fringe in terms of actually supplying uh, a large amount of food. I think that is, I think, this w what direction agriculture will go uh, is, is a real challenge. If we industrialize, you know, we specialize and become very productive, but we maybe by specializing, uh, growing all the crop in one place, if, if climate disaster falls there, then it's all affected. But if we try to diversify and grow it everywhere, maybe it's not quite as productive. So it is, I think, a real challenge to think of, of how we do this. Uh, with the great increases we need, um, you know, it's hard to imagine that we can't, that we can give up something like biotechnology as a tool to enhance yields. But of course, that has, its, has, its, has some risks as well. So uh, it'd be nice to think there are really easy solutions here, but I think, uh, they certainly aren't, I, I don't see that easy solutions, all of them have a trade-off. And fortunately, we have smart people like students here at Northeastern and MIT and other places that will hopefully help, uh, help uh, us uh, uh, th think through this and find the solutions we need. So with that, I would end. Thank you.